Good evening, viewers. I'm Rabe Akhtar. I am Director, Center for Security, Strategy and Policy Research, University of Lahore. We have started this new segment in the School of Integrated Social Sciences, which is called CIS Faculty Conversation Series. Some of my colleagues have already done some great conversations that are available on CISPA's YouTube channel. Many more are lined up, so please subscribe to our channel to watch all our events, conversations, and webinars. This is my first faculty conversation. Uh, we try to make them academic so that there is value in it for students and scholars alike. We meet today at the 22nd Nuclear Anniversary of Pakistan, and I'm joined here today by someone who is the perfect person to talk about nuclear Pakistan, its past, present, and future. Brigadier Feroz Hassan Khan Ratayt is a research professor at the Department of National Security Affairs at the Naval Postgraduate School, Monterey, California. He's the former director of the Arms Control and Disarmament Affairs Strategic Plans Division. A former brigadier in Pakistan Army, Feroz has been dealing with issues of war strategy and nuclear affairs for the past four decades. After completing command, staff, and instructional appointments in the Army, Feroz, with academic qualifications in strategic studies, was transferred to the then newly established Combat Development Directorate in the GHQ. Since then, he has been seeing Pakistan's nuclear program as a practitioner and a scholar, which is a rare combination. He has authored the most authoritative account of Pakistan's nuclear journey, Eating Brass, the making of the Pakistani bomb, which we'll be discussing today in our conversation. So Feroz, welcome to the CIS Faculty Conversation Series. Thank you for your time and availability for this very important conversation. I know this isn't exactly Chahi in the background, but I have tried. Um, I have lots of questions for you, and our audience has also sent in some questions. Uh, we'll begin by asking a couple of rounds and you can answer. The obvious place uh, to start anywhere is your own past and what brought you to this point. So I want you to tell us that what made you choose soldiering as a career for yourself and what drove you to knock the doors of the Pakistan Military Academy? Let's begin there. Over to you, Feroz. Rabia, thank you so much. First of all, Assalamu alaikum, and uh, I'm so uh, humbled that you invited me for uh, for this interview and for this session, whatever you are thinking. And uh, I'm so very proud to to see you and your organization. And you know, I keep following what what you are doing, and and I've been to your place as well. So, I really, I'm very proud whatever law university is doing and your center is doing. So, congratulations on on that from my side. Uh, <clears throat> You, the title of your discussion is Nuclear Pakistan and you're beginning with my life story. So it's pretty much the, the, the nuclear story of Pakistan, nuclear history and my life and my biography actually go together. Not So, you know, it is in that context that I'll begin. So you asked me what brought me to the army. To be very honest, you know, like, you know, any teenager in the late 60s, uh, if you, any people of my age, I was born in December 52. So you can imagine that in around 69, 70 age, the Pakistani ethos was so much affected that military was the most prestigious institution to be then at the time for young people. The aspiration of the time, I don't know about today's younger people, maybe the same, but that time was a very, very prestigious thing to be in the army at the time. But not necessarily, I personally did not think that I was truly cut to be the army type, you know. My parents would think that, you know, I could be a lawyer, I could be a professor, I could be a CSP officer. Actually, I was joining the Lahore Engineering University, but you know, it was this enthusiasm um, to, to join the army at the time that this was happening. 65 war was a very important inflection point in Pakistan's history for younger people of that time. And I can't tell you that the 60s Pakistan will probably never return the same. It was a very different vibrant Pakistan at the time this was happening. But again, I joined the Pakistan Military Academy because my cousins were going there, my friends were, were there, and it was really prestigious at the time. Uh, so I, I could choose anything at the time, but I joined, joined the military academy. And that was the year 1970, November 78 was, was the year that the PMA started. But you know what happened in the whole 1971 year. So we were supposed to be commissioned in 1972, but the entire Pakistani ethos and individual as well was shaped by the events of 1971 
the Bangladesh civil war. And my colleagues, cadets, colleagues who were with me, who are Bengalis, were wonderful people, my course mates, and you know, we had to see them disappear. And so, you know, we were cadets and we were commissioned in November, just one year we were commissioned. So that stopped our education system at the same time. And, you know, and I landed in the army right into the battlefield, straight from the military academy. You like Ross. And think about that, you know, I was, at the time when I joined the academy, I was not even turned 18. And before my 19th birthday was in the battlefield. Uh, so how young you could be at the time when this is happening. And you're seeing that actually on my birthday was December 15th and you, could, you know what happened on 16 December. So I cannot remember my life story began with such a catastrophic event with those, you know, that those days of war. And you see that closely in the battlefield, what things have happened or not happened. And the pride of the nation was like, you know, it was just destroyed. How could this happen to us, you know? So it was December 16, 1971, that completely psychologically changed the Pakistani nation, the people, myself as an individual, you can see my age. That was my 19th birthday. You can think about what's happening. So in that sense, I started. But I think it's an important thing for, for, for people uh, to know, for, uh, uh, people in Pakistan to know, even the army. At the time, you know, when I was growing, I was in a division where my general officer commanding, his name was Agha Ibrahim Akram. Now, anybody who knows this, he was a, he was a giant scholar, soldier scholar. And the British Indian military, which was split into India and Pakistan military, had a very strong tradition of producing soldier scholars. I mean, this goes back to the British time, Fuller, you know, all those people. And then, you know, we had these giants like Jaga, Brian Makram. Uh, very soon, I had another brigade commander whose name was Sonda Khan Malik, who was, by the way, one of the first, uh, you know, uh, chairman of the Department of Defense and Strategic Studies in the 1980s. He was my brigade commander. They were general officers like uh, uh, E.H. Dar, you know, I'm just remembering those names. And we were as young teenagers, young second lieutenant and all, just in the battlefield, you know, sitting all the time before the armies would return back to the barracks. We were told to read books. We were told to write book reviews every weekend. That's so, amazing. you know, you start idolizing people of that caliber who have written so many books and all. So, you know, my military career actually grew in the traditional military way. You know, you, you grow up in, as an infantry officer and then, you know, you do all those courses and all. So it's a, it's, it's a, it's a straightforward upward career process, progression going on in the military. And, you know, but at the same time, this scholarly bend was always there because of these kind of people who were the mentors of the time, you know. So I just wanted to know that, you know, you, there was a system in the army. And then in the right, some prior in, the, in around the mid eighties, again, this is history for, for Pakistan army in many ways. Uh, uh, there were General K.M. Arif, Khalid Ben Arif, for example, one name. How many books has he written? He recently passed. You know. He was a vice chief of the army staff in the mid eighties. He was succeeded by General Beg, General Jangir Kramat, I mean, General Musharraf. All these people have this scholarly bent. You can, they've all written books, you know. You can think through each one of them. Has. So the, the point of, that I'm making is that the Pakistan army has always had that tradition of encouraging soldierly, soldier, soldier, soldier scholar yeah. to actually encourage officers to become on this line. And that's how, that's how I grew up. So, you know, that would explain to you what was the bent from the very beginning and what actually changed me. I did not believe that I was truly the kind of a military officer's typical one, but actually the 71 war and that regimentation and that the, the army has got, Pakistan Army's culture is such, a, is such an attraction that you just become part of that. So you start adopting that. So you always like a hybrid creature as far as I'm concerned, which way, which way you know, um, to go, you know. So that was my background because, you know, and, and you can see that this 70s and the 80s period, a lot happened, you know. I and mean, if you're getting into the history of nuclear Pakistan, and the, this is where the nuclear history begins. Absolutely. The very history begins with my career. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm glad that you talked about the 1971 war and your experience of it because you were amongst the youngest batch of officers who fought the 71 war. 
I want you to tell us something about that experience. Did it shape your thoughts about conventional imbalances and the need to getting a force equalizer? Something that transformed the country's thinking about nuclear weapons later on. What are your uh, you know, experiences from that uh, that you then took forward when you became a part of the SPD later on, which we'll talk about? So tell us something about that. Yeah, actually, you know, at the time, we were very young but at the time, but actually what, what did shape uh, thinking within, within the army, uh, first of all, as I mentioned, it was a big shock because um, the manner in which uh, the surrender happened in Dhaka, it was very, very difficult for the army to reconcile as to how could that have happened. And the more we thought we learned at the time was how that was uh, abetted by India, how the Mukti Banis were trained and how this whole thing was done to basically we, we grew up with this one idea that the whole idea of liberating, liberating Bangladesh from East Pakistan, turning it to Bangladesh was in a sense to humiliate Pakistan, to actually bury the two nation theory. So it, the more it was buried down in our head that, you know, here is an immortal enemy that is actually out to destroy us. Uh, things that you would hear from your grandparents and parents that, you know, India is not reconciled to the creation of Pakistan really was in our face at the time. So that generation of army that grew from that time onwards was actually grew from this sense, not in the sense of conventional imbalance, but actually they saw us vulnerable in East Pakistan, four division strength, you know, like could not be reinforced and could be surrounded from three sides. We were not really prepared to accept that this defeat actually happened on a fair assessment, you know, drawing down a military into nine months of civil war and insurgency, wearing them down, and then, you know, carrying out a naval blockade, air blockade, and then, you know, putting those four divisions down from three sides. You can imagine what, what the key, this was like the DNBN foo of Pakistan to use the French, you know, how the French garrison was, you know, caught in Vietnam. It was pretty much the same thing because, and here in the West Pakistan, we were supposed to launch the repost. So that was the whole idea that, you know, the defense of the East lies in the West. And so we were unable to launch the defense, the, the offensive on this side. Uh, so that, and I was part of the seventh division that was supposed to be part of the defensive core that would have gone into India to, to overturn or that whole battle into onto this side. But of course, that, that did not happen for a wide variety of reasons. And you know, the geopolitics of the time with you know, how China, US, um, Nixon and Summer Swan, there's a much more happening. But one of the things that was happening since you asked that question, you know, uh, we grew up at the time as cadets and in the, in the army that, you know, we were allied of the Western countries. We were allied politics, we were part of C2 Central. We were thinking that, you know, Alliance means that, you know, you, your brother, you, you're one, you know, and that, you know, that dismemberment was happening. So we were all thinking, what was this all alliance about? You know, what, what was Americans doing? You know, we, we would hear something about that. They would come to rescue or some, some kind of seventh fleet or something will come. None of that thing, but that was turned out to be a sort of a shock for us that. So one of the major changes that happened as a result of that in terms of thinking that nobody is going to come to your rescue. Alliance politics is meant for their own interest, not for your, for, the, for your national security. So it does not necessarily mean the way your national security parameters are developed is essentially also the thought process of your ally. And I think that was one of the beginning uh, of thinking that, you know, we got to be independent on our own. And the only way that you could have that independent variable in your external security policy was to go for nuclear weapons. So in that sense, you know, we, at the time we were young, we did not understand all that. This is later we would understand. But I think across the board, after the India's 1974 test happened, across the board, there was no doubt in anybody's mind at the time uh, that now, or this is now or never. And I think I did try to capture that sense I call the never again, that's the chapter in my book, and to capture the sense as to how, how it was. And the leadership of the country at the time was Ulfik Karali Bhutto, who was the nuclear enthusiast of the time, you know. And that's actually where the Pakistan nuclear debate essentially began. Uh, but but to, to put it in the perspective, you know, the 
the defeat of 71 and the manner in which happened laid the foundation of Pakistan nuclear weapons program. And I think Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, within one month of taking power, called the scientists and made it very clear to them what he means. He, he meant the direction of the program. He absolutely. was very clear. Absolutely. There was absolutely no doubt about that. Yeah. You have mentioned and so this, is all, this is all the life story, you know. So these yeah. two events did change at the time. But actually, uh, I'll just answer it, you know, briefly. You can ask uh, later on as well if, if there's a question, you know. So the very foundation after the 74 was that here you already have a conventional imbalance, you know. And you can see that barely at that time in 73, 74 was a time uh, when our prisoners in Indians camp, about 90,000 of them had started beginning to return, you know. Not everyone had returned, you know, when all this was happening. And by 73, 74, uh, I would say, you know, the leadership of Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, you know, was a very charismatic leader. You know, Bhutto's whole popularity in the 60s was youth movement, you know, students. Students were the one who brought Bhutto up. So he was very popular at the time, you know, and we were having Islamic summit in 1974, which is before we were seeing all the leaders in Lahore. People were forgetting that, you know, the wound of 71 and beginning to see uh, Pakistan as a very different Pakistan emerging, you know, uh, like Islamic Pakistan, holding Islamic summit in Lahore. So that youth, that generation of mind began to really see a new light, a new hope. And when India conducted their test in, in around May that year, it's a very important year because that completely brought the second shock to them. That here you have, a, it's like a twin shock. You have a conventional imbalance that a country could destroy you conventionally. And now that has conducted nuclear tests right across your border. So think about the security policy of the country. How could you think about? And that completely changed the Pakistani nascent program or they didn't know which way to go in 72 when Bhutto desired, desired actually the program to go in that direction. But then, it was full blown. Yeah. There was no turning back after 74. There's absolutely no turning back, no matter how many laws, United States, or how many international proliferation, etc., would happen. I can tell you no way Pakistan would have turned back from 74 after that, that event that happened. And that was the whole idea behind it. But in terms of military strategy at the time, we were very naive, you know, I've interviewed so many people from my book and I'm talking about those people who were our bosses and senior at the time. From military power was very, very, very naive about neutral thinking, you know, say, hey, what would happen if India attacked this place? If you come up on the horse? It was very militarily way of thinking what role nuclear weapons could play at the time. Very naive, actually, you know, uh, a way of thinking at the time, you know. Um, how could destroy, can it be used in counterattacks? Can it be used in counterforce? Very, a military weapon, like an artillery weapon, you know. And so it's a very rudimentary thinking that nuclear weapons replaces conventional defense's weakness. That was how the initial thinking in the 70s began. Of course, later on it would mature into a different way, but go ahead, sir. This is the brief, sorry for a long answer, but. No, 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 perfect, perfectly fine. And I think the points that you make uh, about this realist lesson that Pakistan got not to rely on anybody but themselves. I think that needed to be brought out and, and we all need to understand uh, as to how alliances work and you know what lessons we need to you know learn from 71 onward. Um, so, so thank you for that you know comprehensive uh, reply. Uh, so moving on, uh, you know, you have uh, commanded troops at the LOC and IB, um, and from there being part of the Combat Development Directorate in GHQ, I would say that you've seen it all. So how was it like for you to shift your entire thought processes from conventional constructs of war to those of nuclear strategy and deterrence? Because these are, on a spectrum, these are two different realms altogether. What contributed to streamlining your academic bent towards nuclear studies? And here I would want you to tell us as to what do you do at Monterey uh, Naval Postgrad School? Uh, so, so starting from your own experiences about these two realms of conventional constructs of war to nuclear strategy and deterrence and how you landed up in academia uh, with all, all encompassing knowledge. So talk to us about that a bit. Okay, I can give you some short answers because this is a long 
sort of again, again, it is an important uh, inflection point, just not on my life, but actually also how the Pakistani history changed at the time. I mentioned General Aslam Beg and General KMRF, you know, in the mid 80s. Um, at the time in the mid 80s, uh, this was another uh, very important point in the history of convention and nuclear context, you know. And it again has to do with my life, so I can answer it from, from both sense, you know. Um, during the brass tax exercise in 86, 87, there were other elements that were also happening in the, in the world at the time, in our region. Uh, you know, whenever decisions are made or whenever life changing events happen in individual or in the national level, it must be seen as the decision and the metrics of the time that happened. In hindsight, you become wise, oh, he should have done this, you know, it's very unfair. You should see how decisions were made. So uh, when brass tax and all what happened in 86, 87 time, that was a time when the Soviet Union and the United States were also, you know, having a approach with Gorbachev there and the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. We, we were wondering what's going to happen if, if the Soviet and the Cold War ends or what happens now. That not much was thought through as to what would happen if this happens, you know, that was the international INF treaty was going on at the same time in 1987. A lot more were happening uh, when, 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 when all this was going on. Uh, if you recall, during the 86, 87 time frame was also the time when there was a famous interview of uh, A.Q. Khan with the, I think it was with the Kuldeep Nair. And that, this, uh, this is the whole story which I eventually brought back in my room. But at the time when I was a young, person in GHU at the time, a military officer. Uh, we, I remember vividly that these things were all contextually linked together in some ways, you know. After the brass tax, we were saying, what, what could have happened, you know. And there was a lot of rumor about it, which I still call a rumor that there was a threat made uh, to Rajiv Gandhi when um, Zeolak went there and all. I can talk about that. That wasn't exactly a naked threat. But actually, it was a question whether you had the capability or not. What was the nature of deterrence and all? This kind of debate at the time in the mid 80s, people were not thinking in terms of deterrence that even today, young kid and your students, all the time they talk about deterrence. That was a very rudimentary view of seeing what was deterring India at the time. Was it your nuclear capability? Not demonstrated at the time, but sort of perceived at the time. Did Aq Khan leak it deliberately or did it just slip out of the time? He loves to talk, everybody knows that. He just said it. How is it possible that a top scientist whom everybody knew is the most classified thing he's doing in the world, an Indian journalist goes and interviews him, how the hell what happened? What was the security doing? These are all questions in our mind at the time when this was happening. And it's an important juncture at the time. So why it turned upon, because the end of Cold War is happening around this time. And we found that India is modernizing its, its nuclear strategy, uh, the convention strategies in shape and form. And I would say at the time with General Arif and General Aslam Beg followed each other during Zawlak's time, they were both vice chief of the army staff. They were thinking generals, you know. Um, and the Pakistan army then developed the counter response called the riposte and there was an exercise called Zerbi Azab, uh, I remember. No, not Zerbi Azab, Zerbi Moment in 1989. You know, so these were the period when we were sophisticating our conventional plans. You know. And conventional plans at the time when the Soviets are withdrawing from Afghanistan. And the Pakistani military and, you know, thinking at the time was what changes are happening in the world, how the Cold War is ending. You know, it's a very important history of Pakistan because we were still going something called the drag of life. You know. And so it was a General Arif's idea, which was followed by General Aslam Beg, to send young officers to top universities in the world to get educated. So, you know, it's not just to go to staff colleges and do war colleges in, you know, in, in USA and UK and Australia, other places, but actually go to universities and get studied. And, you know, because of that nature of scholarly bent that I was mentioning, you know, myself along with many others, named Saleh, for example, uh, Kasim Qureshi, General Athar, we, I remember all these, we were all together a batch who all went to uh, universities in UK and USA to actually get higher education from civil university. And what then happened was that, you know, when you are educated in a civil universities, you develop different tools of thinking. 
your tools of analysis are different when you learn it from uh, that intellectual uh, band of mind. So from my own standpoint, I was at Science Johns Hopkins University, and this was one of the top school of strategic studies here in the USA, and King's College in London and many others went in these, these places. I'm giving you the beginning of these processes as to how the soldier scholar was beginning actually to get into mid-career officers who would become senior officers in later stages to get this broader spectrum of different tools of analysis. And actually, when we were coming back, and Indian Army people learned about that, which I would learn later on. Uh, even K. Subramani, you know, I, I met him once, and he, he, he used to, see, when he learned about that, this is what the Pakistan Army did in the 80s, he wrote a very big piece in India. He went back, he said, look at Indian officers. They are still you know, coming back from Dehradun and these colleges. They don't know these intellectual thinking. He was very mad at the Indian Army. And he actually wrote a piece with my name on it, with my name on it, because he met me. And when he learned that it's not me alone, there are many more. And he was saying the Pakistani Strategic Plan Division doesn't, didn't come out of nowhere. It came because the Pakistan Army had taught 10, 12, 20 years before that. Of course, we didn't know it's pretty good form at the time. But actually, it was, uh, the, the, it, it's an important thing that how we were leading ahead in terms of thinking just by default, you know. And it was only because they were thinking like General Arif and General Beg and all, they were thinking ahead, you know. So I, I was one of those tools, you would say, of their thinking in the army to go abroad and study there. So when I came back, I was of a different sort of a person, you know. I was on the line of control and commanding and all. That is the time when I just returned back from SIAS, you know. Uh, so I was sent to Seattle Glacier with the line of control. And this is a tradition in the army that if you spend too much good time in Washington or anywhere else abroad, the moment you come back home, you go to the harshest place, you know. So the background picture of yours does not remind me of Chagi, actually it reminds me of Siachi and Glacier for <laughs> Because that's what I was sent there. And, and that was a fascinating experience that I was commanding the 5th Northern Light Infantry, 5th NLI, a fascinating unit uh, that I still remember. And that's really one of the memories of my life that I spent those years when I came back. Initially, when I came back, I was bubbling with knowledge. I should write something, do something, write these books. Where will all this knowledge go? You're throwing me into the wilderness. I was a little mad. I said, look, give me a little breather time. Let me distill all this somewhere, and then you can send me anywhere in the world. But they said, no, army is army. You go there. And it turned out to be a remarkable experience at the time, you know, when I was commanding the fifth, the Northern Light. That was a very different experience, completely different experience from the 1971 war. But that's really, you're fighting the weather, you're seeing the soldiers, you're seeing how these people are fighting. And to be very honest, you know, and I did write, but that's what happens when you start beginning to think. And nobody would disagree with me in an intellectual way, but it's not necessarily liked in the army. And I, I thought that this was a futile war because Indian and Pakistani soldiers were actually dying more of gangrene and frostbites, you know, and pulmonary odema and, you know, celebrity odemas. And, you know, they're just sitting on those heights, which is inhumane to be sitting and fighting those wars and see what's happening on the India-China border even there. So to me, that was in, in, in an intellectual sense, you know, not in the military duty sense, but intellectual sense. And I was commanding officer and I used to argue with my GOCs and all, what's going on here? You know, why are these soldiers dying like this? You know? I mean, this is like, you know, you kill, they kill. I shoot them down. You know, you, you shoot their helicopter down. They shoot my helicopter down. What is this? This is no war. I mean, this is like just, you know, so much precious life and resources are being wasted. You know? Of course, I mean, we all knew what certain issue, issue was at the time. But actually, it was another inflection point in, in my life that happened. And uh, so um, after I finished my commanding duties, I was coming back and this is the story because this is where your question actually comes back into the transition. Um, when I finished my command tenure um, on the line of control, my unit had moved to different places as well. Um, and I was to be posted back on staff assignment. So this is the first staff assignment that I'm being assigned and the, um, and, and the RVG has to decide what to do with this person whom they sent and spent a lot of money uh, to get there. I was on a PhD program, but they said, no, come back and command. So that's a separate story. And that is how it happened that I landed up uh, as uh, with Jen Ziauddin, who was uh, the 
director general of combat development directorate in ghu and uh, that wasn't pretty much known in the army to be a career point of so or so or so or something and i had no idea why i was posted there um, and uh, so when i arrived at general zia then i turned out that he was the one who was asked for my assignment because my resume <laughs> was the one that actually uh, talked about the courses that i did at sais in in um now you have done your book research it's an important thing to to see their transition because i was there from 1981 to 1991 in the middle was 1990 was the pressler famous pressler sanction now as a military officer i was serving serving military officer as a student at sais and i was doing all kind of courses at sais in the strategic studies department like nuclear strategic planning courses arms control and disarmament courses all courses that would be uh, during the cold war and the allied countries would be would be trained on those courses and like professor like dr zvigdu brzezinski and you know many other professors from pentagon would come and teach classes there and so i would i mean i was i was just history you know because after 1990 1991 nobody would ever be teaching those courses to any military officer from pakistan there's no question after that right. because that was the that was a time after that they realized that what, what are we teaching them we teaching them to fight wars we teaching them strategic planning we teaching them to planning but well, all those things were on the manuscript of my manuscript of the size degree that came uh, to the to the pakistan uh, to 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 jhq and that's what general zauddin you know was i we had no idea that at the time that this is what happened so that was the reason i was posted there and he called me and he, he said explain to me your degree what is this degree all about so i explained to him my degree when i late 1993 and i came and then uh, general dangir kamath was the chief of general staff so i did not know why i was posted with him because ostensibly it was a something called a special cell or library something very innocuous name but actually that was where the beginning and it had just begun because again a lot of people have talked about on 22nd may 28th may i was listening to many other things and i wanted to bring something on record for this actually what had happened was that in 1993 just prior to my coming there i came in late 93 but in july 1993 when president gulam sa khan and prime minister nawashi both went home that was the first time where the nuclear decision making processes had moved from the presidency of pakistan to army chief up until that time it was with zulfikar ali bhutto zauddin and gulam sakha and it was an interim government of moin moin qureshi moin that moin at the time and before benazir bhutto uh, you know government got in. there was an interim period and gulam sakha was leaving the office and he said where do i leave all this so it was actually sent to jhq in that period and it was it was an obviously army chief or not so army chief actually put it to zauddin and that was not known as to where all those decision making and obviously the very general would need another officer under him that was the whole chain of event that was a historic event that who was to to hold all that and that is how it all began my journey with with nuclear pakistan with general zauddin and then after general zauddin was uh, uh, lieutenant general uh, zulfikar khan who was my boss so these were my two bosses in, in the combat development directorate and it was there with this arms control directorate was actually formed in you know it was not called arms control directorate but it was uh, we were dealing with these issues and my job was to link with the pakistan foreign office at the time so now i'm getting it getting to know the nuclear diplomacy at, in 1994 at the same time also getting to know what the problems was going on between uh, the internal side and that whole thing expanded under the combat development directorate under general zauddin so in the covid days from 1993 94 onwards till spd was formed in 99 these four five years period was the time it was combat development directorate that was coordinating the nuclear issues in close call and both of them were under the chief of general staff cgs so there was an mo director that was doing the planning and the operation part and then the combat development part was actually doing the combat development so we were dealing with the delivery system which was ballistic missiles that had come at the time coordination of that part 
planning on those elements. And on the other hand, there was a lot of debate that was going on. Uh, the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, the FMCT issues, Chemical Weapons Convention, you know, that's where the arms control things were coming. That was the era of arms control. In fact, the post-Cold War era during the Clinton administration till the time Bush came, that was the real era of arms control. That is how the arms control directorate was formed. It, it was a very different context of the world, you know. Arms control during Cold War, arms control post-Cold War, and arms control post-9-11. But three different, you know, very different sort of. And now, you know, this is like post covid or whatever you want to call it now. So the, the context has completely changed. It was huge because in 1992-93 uh, time frame. And I remember in 93, uh, just before I was actually uh, coming, to, I wrote a paper or something which was probably published in strategic studies and I don't remember where it went. Um, where when Clinton was uh, coming to take over office, his one of his mandate was that, you know, he would be a staunch, uh, uh, you know, champion of comprehensive test ban treaty. And there were many papers that I had read as an arms control student there, which was talking about that the era of arms control is to prevent uh, regional countries getting nuclear weapons. So it was believed to be the elitist club who were supposed to have the nuclear weapons. But if it goes beyond the elitist club, then, and obviously there were many other countries at the time, but Essentially, in the end, there were three countries, Israel, India, and Pakistan. And we all knew at the time that Israel had a special status. So Indian and Pakistanis knew that they were, that was the whole premise of arms control, that CDBT, FMCD, all these regimes are actually, the target countries are these non-NPT member countries who were the target countries. And therefore, how do we uh, protect our nuclear program under these circumstances, while at the same time remaining in the mainstream of the nuclear diplomacy in, 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 in the world, you know. So who would bridge that gap? So th there would be the foreign office, foreign policy, you know, who were dealing with diplomats from Geneva and New York, and then the foreign office, and then GHQ. That bridge was the one that I was one of the staff who was bridged between the two places. That's how it all started in the mid-1990s, you know. And it was not just uh, the spectrum of, uh, uh, nuclear issues, but also it was spilling over into national domain as well, uh, like land mine, land mine uh, conventions, uh, ballistic missiles conventions, other forms of, of weapons, weaponries. So we were all much concerned about how it would happen. You know, like inspection regimes are happening, challenge inspection regimes in the chemical weapons convention. We all feared at the time, not just Pakistan, everyone else, that the regime, chemical weapons challenge inspection regime would be abused to actually intrude in Kahuta or other places. So all these things, we would be, you know, sitting with diplomats and bringing those procedures so that we protect them, that if it is unrelated, how to prevent from abuse, how to develop procedures so that, you know, we have a system that we protect our interests, you know. And we learned all those techniques that are uh, taught here in Sandian labs and other places in later stages, managing access. I'm just giving you those background because this is all part of my life that became sort of part of uh, the systematic things in Pakistan, the evolution of arms control thinking in Pakistan. That is so fascinating. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, this, yeah. my life story is, is not my life story, it's the story of what was happening in the country. And you could think about mid nineties, the CTBT debate going on, the ring magnets debate going on, the M11 controversy going on and uh, you know, uh, um, Pakistan is now embarking upon uh, ballistic missiles going, F-16s are blocked. It was a very different era of, you know, press sanctions going on and how to get removed from the sanctions. Um, so that is how the transition from a soldier to scholar is happening. And now I'm in the, I'm in the center of all this is what was going on in the mid nineties. And I'll stop my story here by giving you one not a very happy one, but I was a mainstream military officer. I would have gone to do the command and other things. And all these things were stalled because of my long, long stint and uh, at size. I've been outside the country. So by the time I'm getting back into the mainstream of command and war college and that thing, um, uh, I got promoted to the, to the brigadier rank and I was about to go for that when I suffered a heart attack at the, in, the, in the tennis court. 
So as many military officers would know, once you suffered a heart attack and you are down categorized militarily, your military career ends right there. So my military career ended uh, at that point. And after that, I was recovering from what were my health issues. And the rest is kind of history because that's a new test happens. And then I had only one choice left, one pathway left to, to get back to my, the soldier hyphen academic. So the soldier will diminish and the academic will come up. That's my story. Fascinating uh, details, uh, you know, Feroz. Uh, there's a lot of learning for all of us, you know, starting from this whole, uh, you know, soldier scholar evolution, uh, which is not only your evolution, but also the evolution of how military as an institution has groomed its uh, officers over a period of years. And then, you know, your uh, intellectual pursuits abroad, and then bringing them and the those being used uh, by the military uh, to give you positions, you know, further when the strategic plans division was set up. Um, so with this, um, I would like to move to this, uh, you know, so our audience is um, a learned audience, informed audience has read your book. Majority of them, I would say, have read your book. Anybody who's interested in this subject, uh, you know, it, it cannot escape your work. So my question to you is, uh, you know, once we talk about eating grass, um, you know, your, uh, your excellent, you know, I, I just am short of adjectives for it. What motivated you to write that book? You know, because uh, in Pakistan, you know, the kind of culture that we have, unfortunately, you know, not a lot of people write intellectual um, you know, uh, uh, they don't follow their intellectual pursuits and they don't produce uh, books. Um, so we don't have even a whole volume of memoirs. We don't have a culture of oral history. And when I was writing my own book, I uh, felt that, you know, this is one area where Pakistan needs to produce. So you wrote Eating Grass. I want uh, you to talk to us in a sense because there are students as well as alike who are listening who will be listening to this talk once we post it up on youtube later um you uh, it's a it's a work that is uh, rich with primary sources uh, oral history interviews how did you collect those could you have gotten access to those oral history interviews had you not been a part of that organization itself and not known those people I, I maintain that I, as a scholar, civilian, uh, would not have had access to those oral history interviews if I had pursued, uh, you know, something like eating grass from a Pakistani perspective. Therefore, I, you know, did it from a U.S. Uh, perspective and use U.S. historical sources. So, talk to us about that process itself while you talk about how and why did you decide to write that book. And why was it important to get Pakistan's history out there? So over to you for that. Rabia, thank you so much. I'm sorry, I'm always probably giving you longer answers because you, you put my story into, life story into that. So a little more from the where I ended for the 1998 test in Combat Development Directorate. That's a whole paradigm change. I mean, this is completely changed now. And now the SPD is formed and I'll not go into the details because that Combat Development Directorate was, uh, Eventually, you know, it was disbanded and those portion dealing with nuclear became part of SPD. So part of that grew into the SPD and the SPD was formed. It's another history which I've written in the book already. So that is how it happened. And because my, like you asked me the question previously as to how did I transition and how did I reach here as a Naval Postgraduate School, I want to give you that because it has to do with the background of how eating grass started. Um, so I uh, was, uh, at the fag end of my, my military career, uh, I, I was left with about two years of uh, service, you know, uh, in SPD. And uh, so um, I wanted to start off where I left in 1991 with Dr. Brzezinski and all. I wanted to restart there because now I said, look, I mean, let me finish my doctorate now. This is my life now. So I requested for, at the time, nobody knew about these fellowships, you know. So I wanted to get back to SIAS to finish all that. And they advised me, why don't you come on series of fellowships here and we'll take it from there. And by virtue of this arms control directorate, all these uh, big names in the nuclear world, they were associated, you know, I became, I was a face of SPD all over the world. I was talking all over the places. 
So these mentors of mine who were mentors in the 1980s, like Professor Leitch, Professor Stephen Cohen, Michael Crepon, you know, Dr. Elliot Cohen, all these big names uh, who were in the strategic studies world uh, were now known to me. And I was pursuing that I'm now heading to finish off where I had left, you know. So I had actually applied for, so the army actually gave me uh, 30 months, two and a half years of leave, study leave to go. And I was already ending the mechanic, so I requested the army that, you know, what's the point, you know, I mean, there's no point taking leave, so I'll go on the leave, but you know, it's just, this is the end of my military career, I'll become an academic. So I really, literally turned, because that was the end, I wanted to hang my boots and, and I was, uh, give a lot of, uh, so it, that is how my journey to United States began with a fellowship in Stanford University, Woodrow Wilson Center, Brookings. And this is a very critical period in 2000 and 2001 when I'm applying all this. And think about that this is post-nuclear test and we have nuclear sanctions, we have nuclear test sanctions, we have Preston sanction, we had a military sanction, a military coup. So we are sanctioned under sanctions under sanctions you know, at the time. And this is the time, you know, and I, I began with the whole project for which I was, you know, accepted to come as a visiting fellow was a buzzword that is in the buzzword. That time nobody used that word. It's called strategic stability in South Asia. And the reason why that was so attractive was because I was a face that was presenting Pakistan's strategic strength regime. I believe just about two days ago, the Pakistan foreign minister also mentioned that. And this is like a 20 year old concept that was conceived at the time. And I used to be presenting that because it, it was evolved on that desk uh, from there which you can talk later on if you want to have more time that how that evolved is another story I've also written in the book. People can read that in the book. That is what happened. But then three events happened back to back when I was doing this fellowship at the time. 9-11 uh, happened. 9-11 happened four days after I landed in Woodrow Wilson Center in Washington DC. You're familiar with that place, right? On opposite White House. And then after three months, you have India, Pakistan standoff for that almost went to war in 2001 and two. And so when the whole world focuses come right, the cross is on South Asia, on Afghanistan, Pakistan, you have India, Pakistan sitting, there's a nuclear war. Here is a scholar writing on stability and the whole world focused on me. And at the time, Malia Lodi was the ambassador and all these people, it's very, very hard to imagine. Like I was mentioning, it's very difficult to recollect how, what happened in 71, when the catastrophe happened. It's very hard to recollect the, the enthusiasm of the country of the 1998 test. Many of you, you may remember that, but, but then it's very hard for people in Pakistan particularly to really have the sense as to what really did happen after 9-11 and what the world looked like in Washington DC on 12 September and 13 September. I was right there at the time. And that was, I mean, this is like a paradigm shift. This was like maybe even worse than Pearl Harbor. I mean, you know, this was a very huge event and that completely changed how mad Washington was and right in the center of which country would be named all the time, Pakistan, Pakistan, Pakistan all the time. Nowhere. Now it's very hard for people to recognize what was going on, how decisions were made, but I'm giving you that, that affected all of us. And because I was in the Woodrow Wilson Center, I was really became part of the Pakistani tool, diplomacy at the time. And then standoff was happening. So all the time I would be on CNN, I would be all over. So it was just incident, coincidental that life happened this way. And then um, it was in that context that I came to give, deliver a talk at the Naval Postgraduate School. I gave a seminar. And one year, sometime in 2002, uh, uh, the Naval Postgraduate School asked me that if I could come and teach here, uh, courses for one year or so. Uh, that request, because I was still active duty, I was still not, my retirement was still in process, so I sent it to the Pakistan, uh, through the Pakistan Embassy to GHQ and for them to make the decision. Well, there was obviously bureaucratic thing. I'm, I'm a different army, different country, teaching in a military school here, so there were a lot of security clearance process at this end and the Pakistani end. So they had to give me the NOC to come here without Pakistani government's no, NOC, I, they could not accept without State Department clearance. They will post, so I went through almost a one year process of clearances at both ends, you know, whether, and again, like I said, Pakistan had this era that look, I mean, this is a different time. And, you know, 
if we are getting opportunity for us to be a professor at an institute, it's very good for, for the country to, to place everywhere. There's hardly anybody from Pakistan to be in a very unique sort of a situation in a position. In. And lo and behold, uh, the moment I got that clearance to come, I came here in 2003, one of the biggest controversy that happened was Ekyu Khan. So that Ekyu Khan controversy, that whole network busting happened. So three back-to-back, -back, even 9-11, the drought of Afghanistan, Pakistan, and India-Pakistan standoff, and then Ekyu Khan. These three things became the one, and I'm teaching all these courses on India, Pakistan, South Asian security and nuclear proliferation. So now your question about where did eating grass start on this? And I must give eating grass credit goes to, I mean, not me, uh, but actually it goes credit to General Kedwai. And I want to say this on record. Uh, again, that shock of Ekru Khan unraveling only General Kidwai can tell you what was the event, how, how important, how difficult it was. I mean, I was a professor here, who so, okay. But again, I know from his vantage point how big a deal. It was no less than 9-11. And you know what was being talked about here? It may, you, I mean, people may not like it, but that's just a fact, you know. Nobody would say it up front but 9-11 would be blamed on Pakistan that, you know, you were the ones who were supporting the Taliban, who in turn were supporting Al-Qaeda, who did this to us. Nobody would say what the Americans did in the 80s and all. That's just history. I'm just giving how raw the feeling were here. And on top of it, when this AQ Khan thing happened, they would say, you know, you people are, you know, you're doing everything to the detriment of our interest, you know. So it was so much of controversy, you know, like Sultan Bashiruddin Memu, then those Majid meeting with Osama bin Laden, and that used to be all over. Everything Tang is talking about, all those issues were being talked about here. And, and I'm one person, the MB, how, much, how many people were here to tell all these things? So I'm just telling you how difficult, what was the handicap of all this? So eating grass actually began in the sense that it was my idea when I was here with Peter Lavoie, who was uh, the director of the research center and then he was a professor here, we were teaching together. So I approached Peter Lavoie and I said, look, we have to co-author and write the book because up until that time we had Israel and the bomb, we had China and the bomb, we had uh, India and the bomb, we had, and it so happened that, and, and it's important to know that, you know, you're, you're asking how it was currently done. The fact is that when the challenge is big, that you meet up the challenge. All of these authors, except for George Perkovich, who wrote India and the Bomb, he was in Carnegie. All these authors that I'm na na naming, you know, David Hallam, you know him, our friend. Solid in the Bomb. He's right here in Stanford. It's about an hour away from where I am. Then we had, uh, you know, uh, China and the Bomb, you know. John Lewis date. When I was a visiting fellow, his office was next to mine and we used to chat a lot about Pakistan and the bomb and China and the bomb. And I learned so much from him, late John Lewis at the time. And Abner Cohen was here in Middlebury Institute here in what Miss Institute, Israel and the bomb, you know. So you can see that all these books were written here and it was a fascinating that there is no such book equivalent. You know, there were books written, but not quite at that level. So uh, I suggested to, uh, that this is how you know we should write. Otherwise, Pakistan nuclear program will only be associated with the Ekuhan network and nothing else. Nobody would know the story of Pakistan nuclear program, how it evolved, what happened, unless we get to the bottom of this whole thing. Like we don't have a book like that, and that was a fascinating idea at the time. And why I told to General Kidwai because when we went and presented to Kidwai, and he said, "Look, he was convinced that." This is the story is going to be like that. And he said, okay, give, give, give me a plan, which is coming to the question about methodology, et cetera. So we presented a whole proper presentation in SPD. This is what we intend to do, what we requested them, the methodology, and why we did this. And I've written all this in the preface of the book, by the way. So it's, it's not that you listen to me, it's also written in the preface of reading grass. So um, obviously, um, they went through a lot of process. Almost Pakistan government took almost eight, nine months. 
And again, I would say this was a different era. The U.S. Pakistan relation was really on the up. And uh, this was General Pervez Musharraf's time. It was a very open time, openness. He himself was writing his book, Line of Fire. So encouragement towards intellectual writing, etc., was very much, you know, this was a very different time when people would be encouraged to write that. And I had full support. So what was agreed upon? Because, you know, now you are, you know, let's say you're trading at a very, um, uh, you know, bottom, you know, on, on the edges of classified information on sensitivity as well. So it's a very difficult subject to write and very controversial subject to write. Uh, you know that, you know the controversy. So uh, first of all, the controversy was that this is not a proliferation story. Everybody was writing about Aq Khan and proliferation. You name any, it's, everybody would love to write that. People have done PhDs on that. I don't want to name them, but you probably know. Nobody knew this, but this was the in subject. So everybody would just write on that. The other part was uh, the stability part compared, you know, that here are two nuclear armed countries together next to each other. India, Pakistan are considered to be the most likely two nuclear armed countries to go to war. And that is even true today. I mean, I'm talking about the intellectual thing in here. You know. And then the issue was relating to the pilferage of nuclear, you can you know, call it nuclear terrorism as they would call, you know, about so all these questions, everything which can go wrong on the nuclear side, up front and center of the name was Pakistan. That is how, look at the handicap, this was how the, that atmosphere existed here. And I'm talking about 2004 and five. So when we presented them and then Kedvai agreed, so after a lot of going back and forth, I must say that there were many people whom I don't wish to name, they were skeptics. People were not willing to be cooperative since you asked me the question and even at the time, because uh, uh, there were many who were never wanted this to happen. They never wanted a book to be written uh, for a wide variety of reasons. And I don't want to get negative about it, but I knew it even at the time. You know. But I think the decision was made that you will give you full support. So the, how the methodology was that uh, I would be sending the questionnaire about we're sending them the list of people whom our preliminary research would be done. So that was the questionnaire would be sent to them. They will vet the questions and say, what questions can the person interviewing answer the question? And what question they, he should not answer or we should not ask. And then the idea was that if those questions that uh, the individual scientist or politician, whosoever, would not answer, we would be given a background briefing at SPD, you know, they would give us the answer, what is, should be the answer, you know. And because I was part of SPD, so I was also conscious, I was part of the same organization. So obviously I would not write or do anything which will be detrimental to their uh, interest. That should be, that was just almost understood and it should be understood even now. Why, why, why the hell, you know. So, and I was so conscious about the sensitivity of, to know to what extent. But you know, my sensitivity and judgment and yours and somebody else's will be different depending on what. So everybody has its own red line. You know. But when you're writing a, a book which has to be published at that level, like Stanford Press or Georgetown Press or uh, at, the, at the Ivy League Press level, to have that, that imp impact, uh, you know, there's a, the, the word of administration and the word of literature publication is two different worlds altogether. You know, their convention, scholarly convention is very different uh, than the military or, or bureaucratic convention, if you will. The twain shall never meet. And if you are a scholar, you're writing, this is going to be your frustration. If you want to get clearance on the administration part and also do a scholarly word to really reconcile the two deep conflicting, you know, conventions is nearly impossible, at least in the case of Pakistan. And, and but I was so confident that because, you know, this is being done. So not only that he supported for those interviews. So we were told that we could not interview anybody who's active dude, active scientist, active one. Uh, Ikku Khan was not allowed for me to talk, but others could be talked. And SPD facilitated the interviews, uh, all the interviews. So we initially began the Peter Lavoy and myself together for almost two years. Then we also requested them that they could declassify a document. And I'm sure this is of much interest to you as a historian. Uh, that and and that the Pakistan government actually did say that yes, all classified, all 
documents uh, in the archives and foreign office and etc could be declassified and handed over to them but just flag this point again but that was approved but you don't it doesn't exist in pakistan there's no such culture of declassification there's no culture of archiving um, we went to foreign office they tried to do all this but actually there's nothing available nobody's going to go down and pull those files or archive it because it doesn't exist there so therefore oral history was the primary thing and then you know the third for what were the published sources you know books whatever was written newspaper cuttings and all so we also requested that you know we could have a research assistant so in pakistan you know who could help us you know to open sources you know and i'm grateful you know uh, mansoor uh, mansoor was in cisss now he had a great deal i think from 2006 7 onwards he was very very helpful in giving all the open sources research and all he compiled a lot so and but so it so happened that peter lavoy went into the government from here after one year or so somewhere in late 2006 early 2007 and uh, after that you know the project was left with me so the next 4 5 years i was the only one who had to do that and for me to reach that level was the hardest achievement of my life and i had to really prove that you know my transition to the soldier to the academic world of this level uh i have to prove the metal otherwise i wouldn't survive here so i came here to nps for one year contract but now it's almost like 18 years but i have to really become that level of scholarly uh, bars otherwise you wouldn't survive here you know you could survive for some time but not that long so i'm grateful to pakistan army that who gave me this opportunity to pakistan itself as a country who provided me all this experience to be where i am today. but this was how eating grass started conceiving and and i can tell you that i had almost about 50 to 100 i can write four books out of that whole reservoir that i have and you were doing phd i used to talk often on the phone here when you were at cancer so i remember that you know all those things were going on at the time excellent support you know people would come out in great interviews so why eating grass is important is not, it's, it's, i'm being very immodest here allow me for being in borders for a few seconds you know uh because it is not my story it's not my pen that wrote my job with the pen was to keep my voice but also not let the the review and other process take away the thing it was the hardest experience of my life because and people don't understand what publication in an ivy league means you write something the, the anonymous review will crash like hell he'll come back and say what nonsense are you talking this is crap and it especially when they are so much uh, intuitively against the country to get that narrative out is extremely difficult extremely difficult because some would say i'm fudging ekukan somebody is saying i'm fudging the military's role in proliferation somebody would say that i'm fudging china's role somebody would say oh what, who the hell is this guy let us know what is his vantage point who is he we don't know him he is not in at war he is not scott sagan i'm the first time author of that kind of level so many of these people would actually you know come back and these were the difficulties of the of the manuscript um my manuscript had turned four times over you know four times over it was and uh, then it was the smallest thing i don't know if you have been through all this for example the book cover has pin stack picture now Stanford University Press would not pick that book cover up until and unless clearance come from Atomic Energy Commission copyright through SPD. Um, the diagrams in say those those data in in, in there, um, there was a big you know difference as to you know is it mine? How did I get this data? Obviously the data is so much of open sources, and I'm trying to get those data verified. That look, um, if I write that this capacity of this plant is this much. this is going to be the gospel truth because it is coming from my background as a former spd so it will be the truth let me know whether this is truth or not because you know it's better to be correct you know you don't have to you know so there were many many difficulties through which this methodology and the book process went you know so and then the oral history part if you're a historian i it's important for people to know if you're writing another one somebody on in any other topic on there is one event if it is a successful event in this case nuclear program is a successful event so everybody is the father 
everybody wants to claim their role in it. Nobody wants to give credit to anybody. Very rarely it would happen that somebody would give credit to somebody else, particularly in the scientific community. And then the narrative of the same event between the military senior officers and the diplomats would differ, politicians would differ. So it was a very, very difficult way to wade through who is right and who is wrong on the same event. And there, I've got numerous stories on that. And then you have to exercise judgment as to what is it that you must put in the book that reinforces uh, the, the academic themes, you know, the literature, the, the, the theory aspect that was part of that. And in this case, it was, uh, it was about, you know, realism through the lens of strategy culture and explanation of three distinct uh, new ideas about why states go nuclear in the sense. It's not beyond, it was beyond security, but I came with this whole idea, which, which became very popular in the world. Even today, people, PhD students and others talk to me. This is about that nuclear acquisition of nuclear weapons is done when states and societies go through national humiliation. You know, like now David Halloway writes about what you know, remember about the Soviet and you know, about how Chinese, everyone had gone through the humiliation. And then the sense of isolationism, you know, the sense of isolationism uh, is another Israel and others, you know, Holocaust. So those very thematic things came out. But what truly really attracted uh, in the case of, specifically in the case of Pakistan was the sense that nuclear weapons capability had association with the national identity. And I think that was very fascinating because that was very unique to Pakistan. You know. So then the idea was, was it about, well, yes, it was the first Muslim country to acquire a nuclear weapons country. And this was very huge for national identity. Think about that Pakistan national identity. At the very root of that national identity uh, was challenged by India when they defeated Pakistan and said two nation theory is dead. And so then nuclear capability will have the, you know, the survivability of the state of Pakistan. And that's survivability of the state of Pakistan that separated from India under Boom Jinnah's vision. The nuclear Pakistan will then show the survivability of that country. And that's what the national identity is. That it is the only Muslim power that acquired that capability and has been able to advance that capability. Now that's very unique in the case of Pakistan. When I go around lecturing there and people, their eyes pop out on this question. They didn't realize that really this is and this is not quite the Islamic bomb as it was viewed in the 70s, 80s, but it is a very peculiar national identity of the country. So actually eating grass became very unique from this theoretical perspective in one account. And on the second account, it was the story of the people who are not living anymore, who would never probably be, you know, anyway, even if those who are living will probably never be allowed with that glasnost and prestroka of, at the time of General Musharraf and General Kidwai and all, they were so, you know, welcoming to get this story out. So what Eating Grass did was that it changed the story of the people who were more or less unsung heroes, whose name would never have come in the light of the day. And they would give their perspective. People like Saabzada Yaku, people like Agha, uh, Agha Shahi, uh, General K.M. Arif, uh, Sayyid Rafaqat Ali, I'm just giving the names of people who are not living anymore. Uh, Dr. Ashwak Ahmed and, you know, uh, Samar Mubarak Band and, you know, Javed Mirza, you know, I mean, God give them healthy life, General Aslam Beg. These are the big names that, that I can speak from top of the head amongst many other scientists. And General Kedwai himself, his, his background briefing would clarify so many things to bring that. So it wasn't just that my knowledge alone that would put the place. Uh, one more clarification that uh, the, this book was written as a third person sort of a thing in the first few drafts, but it had to become a sort of first person because one of the reviewers, anonymous reviewers said that we want to know the vantage point of the author. What is his story? What is his story, his history? So like you're asking me the question. So, and I wanted to be a little more modest because usually authors don't write about me. I, I did not want to write that, but I was actually literally forced uh, by the publishing process to do that. So I had to write the story of combat development program, write the story where all my own personal knowledge would come. And then firewall those personal knowledges, which I thought was more into the realm of uh, the classified part. You know. uh, there are three aspects of eating grass that uh, are not covered in that, which is short on that. And I'm, I'm, I think, you know, 
The first aspect is that it doesn't bring the Ikukan story completely. Because, and the reason was that Ikku Khan, so much was written about him in a very controversial manner. So I only wrote that part of Ikku Khan's story, which was not known in other publications. And by the way, it is also for the record, and I'm going to say this, because there were like two, uh, uh, two uh, chapters in uh, the famous uh, dossier written by Institute of Strategic Studies, the Ikku Khan dossier. Actually, those two chapters from there, I think it's four or five, I don't remember, but it was at the time Peter was with me. So we actually handed over those two chapters to the dozier in Ekuhan dozier of double and double. That would have been part of eating grass, actually. So I just wanted for that. So Ekuhan's story and his story is, and so sometimes people have criticized me that I've been unfair to Ekuhan, and I wanted to give the reason that. One was that his access was not there, his story. But Ekru Khan, there's nothing, even if he had the access, he talks so much, we already know what he has to say. But Ekru Khan's story was more about his contribution. There's no doubt about that. People criticize me that I don't, I've not brought him as the hero of the nuclear program. Well, that's not quite true. Ekru Khan is quite a hero. But I don't believe that a nuclear program has one hero. There is, everybody's a hero at a different point of time. You know, somebody, everyone was a hero in a different way, you know, so because that's a successful program. I think the second point uh, in that book that is missing is the diplomatic effort. And I think that's where, I think, Ravi, your, your work is very important because that is a very important part, the diplomatic part. What was the diplomatic string? How the diplomatic history, nuclear diplomacy, is something which is not, I could not completely write. And I think Malia Lodi's criticism on that, I think she, it was her critique. Very valid, I think that's one element that is sort of a missing from, from that. These are the two sort of a major, uh, you know, and of course, I mean, you know, if you write and any author, anyone who writes, you always thinks that, you know, there is always something is always short in the book, you know. So there could have been a lot more written about, uh, you know, the stability and other part, you know, which uh, was coming at the later part. So I, put too much onto the historical part. There could be much more technical parts and other things which, which is still missing. So Eating Grass is just a book. And I think Pakistan nuclear history is such a fascinating history that hundreds of books can be written. Uh, and I think it would be highly encouraging for your students and you yourself actually to continue this great work you're doing. Sorry, I talked too much. But. Oh, no, perfectly fine. Uh, fascinating answers once again. Um, I also, you know, you've set such a high bar, um, academic, intellectual standard for any uh, of us to meet because of the quality of the work that you produce. Uh, it is going to, it is a textbook material. Uh, it is a go-to book for any Pakistani uh, who wants to know and understand our history as to how we have gotten to the point where we are. And the point that you make about national identity, I hope after listening to you today, people read your book once again to that perspective of national identity as to how it's the nuclear program sort of anchors, you know, all of us together. Uh, and this is what I, my tribute to, my very humble little, little tribute to all the, you know, uh, bureaucratic, diplomatic, scientific community, uh, military, uh, how through my own work is. Um, it, it's a very, it's a very difficult uh, balance that you want, you have to maintain when you're working with Western public publishers. And I can completely understand your dilemma there. And I want people to appreciate that even through going through that rigorous process, um, you have still, um, you know, able to let the evidence speak for itself and maintain that uh, narrative and perspective and brought the balance out. It's been extremely difficult exercise. I can appreciate that because I've dealt with that process and I want our viewers and students to understand that it is not easy to work with Western publishers. But hats off to you for, for managing that and pulling off uh, a masterpiece. And thank you so much for writing that. Um, with this, I would make a segue to my last question because I'm conscious of time here as well. Um, 
And what I'm going to do with this question is, um, you know, let you answer. Uh, and Davin, some, some of the questions our audience also sent to us. So, so we have completed 22 years of overt nuclearization since 1998. Um, I want you to look at the next 22, like 2042, guys. And tell us, uh, how do you see our region evolving? You know, uh, today uh, there is an India-China face-off uh, in Ladakh that is happening. These three countries are nuclear weapon states and they share troubled borders, you know, uh, in this region. Uh, so there's that one aspect of it. I also want you to talk a bit about Fox U.S. relations with respect to our nuclear program and even beyond that, you know, you've been, uh, you've conducted some of the most important strategic dialogues between our communities uh, in Pakistan and US. So talk a bit about that aspect. What role do you see, uh, or how do you see the evolution of that happening, this relationship of US happening? And then uh, lastly, end on, you know, what is, where, where is our foreign policy heading as a nuclear weapon state? What do you see should be the pathway? Should we act, are we acting like a nuclear power? Um, do we have that we, we, you know, in our consciousness? Why does it not translate into our actions? Uh, so, so on those lines, I want you to uh, end your talk uh, in, a, in a futuristic sense. Tell us, tell us how do you foresee this region evolving? How would you do that? So thank you, Rabia. Actually, the so I the course one of the courses that I teach here, and I'm go going, to, going to teach again that I was talking to you earlier online is called the geopolitics of Southern Asia, and uh, that's a that's been a very popular course that I've been teaching for the last six eight years, which includes all these elements, the questions that you have asked, you know, um, and uh, the second question did you ask about the U.S. Pakistan? So U.S. Pakistan, you India kind of a trilateral. Thing. And actually, it all started when I came here to the Naval Postgraduate School. We started these dialogues in a very different form, and others started copying that. Um, and of course, uh, about the Pakistan foreign policy, I'll answer. So these are three separate, all lectures, and you know, I'll try to be brief because they've already taken a lot of your time. You know, about this trilateral dynamics going on uh, right now, I've, I've read a lot what you have written about. So. I'm not a person who would have this kind of a crystal ball for 20, 22 years that, you know, it's very hard to see. Uh, I was surprised to see you said 2042. I don't know why it was there because uh, one of the first projects that I worked in year 2001 and 2001 with at, at Stanford was called South Asia 2020. It was, it is 2020 already now you're talking. That was a book. And if that book is still there. And I would, I, I hope your students can read those books because the, these book chapters were written by almost like who is who on geopolitics and, and other issues. And Hassan Asri Rizvi is one of the persons who's written the sorry book on to, Pakistan sorry strategic. To, sorry to cut you here. I think it would be fascinating to review that book in 2020 now. Absolutely. See how it goes. Yeah, the, the book is titled South Asia 2020. Um, it's edited by Michael Chambers, but it was Scott Sagan and others who organized at Stanford University. And in that book is the first uh, 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 chapter written by uh, Dr. Hassan Askri Rizvi, Pakistan Strategic Culture. I think that is probably one of the finest piece on strategic culture on Pakistan that he has written. You know, I've also written on that, but it doesn't read that. That's very original, you know. And I did borrow from there as a lens to develop the eating grass mm -hmm. as well. So I must give him a lot of credit on that because, uh, from that standpoint, you know. Um, but we, I, I was just looking back at that, what were we thinking at the time and what could happen? And you will see that partially a lot of things that was anticipated about 2020 has somewhat happened here. If we really look into the geopolitics of the time, it was about rise of China. It was about how South Asia will be situating itself in the context of rise of China. And we have already seen what is happening. The only thing that is missing was that nobody had anticipated Osama bin Laden and the terror part. That was something which completely changed the, the dynamics of the region, which was not part of that. But we were looking into the nuclear future about uh, 
thinking from that standpoint where credible minimum deterrence analysis would land. The reason I'm saying 2020 because that, you know, the future is what is in the past, you know. Uh, frankly, at the time, in, if you're going back and looking at 2001 and see where India and Pakistan are in terms of 2020, we could anticipate that at some point India would be putting a triad. That was even thought about even back then. And India has fielded a triad. Uh, the level of uh, sophistication that has happened because we could not know that there will be artificial intelligence, there could be autonomous weapon system, there could be cyber. These were all this technological evolution that has now shaped now was not anticipated at the time. We talk about minimum credible deterrence, credible minimum deterrence, minimum deterrence. We kept on fighting over these words, which in essence mean nothing. The minimum was never a minimum. But we, we kept on just defining it. The whole core of the whole crux was what is credible and it's credible will always be advancing. And by the way, back 2001, nobody could have thought that, they would, that the US would move away from its long-standing leadership on non-proliferation and give a deal to India. So all these factors have so significantly changed in ways that international um, great power relations towards South Asia uh, significantly transformed by 2020 uh, because of uh, so many factors that were, could not were not anticipated. And those three critical factors, I would at least put it, one was, uh, you know, the, the breakaway of uh, terrorism, you know, the hub, you know, how it, it, it became. And these non-state actors that was ravishing all over the region and that started affecting the India, Pakistan and Pakistan, Afghanistan and China, all relationship was developed. That was one very important element. And as I see that, that part, the terrorism part is eventually going to go, that genie is going to go back into the bottle in the next couple of years. You know, going, I'm, I'm looking forward, you know. I don't see that part really lasting much for long. Even though when I say this, you know, wait for my next book, by the way, I'm just sort of giving you a premier on these things. This is such a tragic of South Asia that while one country is thinking of really shutting down that tool of asymmetric warfare that has been so counterproductive to Pakistan. Now we're doing Zerbe Aza, we were doing the Raddul Fasad, so we're getting rid of this all. At the, that very time when the Pakistanis are trying to put the genie in the bottle, India is trying to pull out its own genie out. And this is like a G Dover, the other openly talking about, you know, fifth generation warfare, openly talking about doing Baluchistan and all. Nobody did that. Nobody could have even thought that you, you could blatantly come and speak from Red Fort to say, I am doing this in Baluchistan and in Gilgit. Can anybody conceive of the kind of world nobody could have thought about at that time? So the kind of liberal world order and the norms of the international systems that existed at the beginning of the century, by 2020, things are happening that really people of my age and my generation, people would really be scratching their head. What the hell? How can leaders talk like that? And that includes, by the way, US leader as well, including, I'm not sparing anyone here, the kind of languages that is happening in the world, the right wing swing of those authoritarianism and the nature of the change that has happened in the state system, which is very, very pathetic, you know. So I would have said that, you know, this kind of jihadi thing will eventually go down, but what India is unleashing now, it will come back to haunt them again what they, they have not realized what they have done. So that is one thing as I can say, and I'm not talking about 2042, I'm talking about near more near terms and a decade or so is more easier to foresee, you know. The other part was the technological part, which obviously we couldn't anticipate then, but we could do now. And this is a very big question and it is not, again, uh, a lot of people in a lot of uh, young scholars have written and I probably endorse almost all of them, you know, some of them have written remarkably on, on the issue of technological evolution here. And because we deal almost every day here in Naval Postgraduate School in USA, this is the subject all the time. Artificial intelligence, cyberspace, and all these discussions are happening all the time. So I think the biggest danger here is autonomous weapons taking over in nuclear armed capable countries, which is very, very hard. So that will be the second major change here that has to be looked at. Many of the people have written about that. Uh, 
you asked about the uh, track tools we did. We did a lot of track tools to, to determine where these uh, inflection point about escalation, de-escalation, war termination, what all are the cause of, cause of escalation and how can that be controlled or all those assumptions based on which doctrines, known doctrines are evolving. We do try to test those doctrines only to arrive at the conclusion that uh, we are very lucky. We are just lucky. We just don't know what could happen, how escalation control could be. And especially when you have all kinds of tools of new technological tools that are happening, uh, there could be encouragement to keep on testing below the, the perceived threshold of each other to keep on proking. Uh, to put it in a more uh, scholarly way, the, ins the stability instability paradox is going to be seen much more because the new tools are providing greater ways to cause instability paradigm and the spectrum is going to increase a little bit more because you know you could test the threshold through such innovative means, either through UAVs or precision guided munitions or you know, a lot of things that are happening, you know, that could be to space. So this is such a very evolving sort of a thing that on, on the technological front, you know, uh, and I can say. Um, and the third part is the geopolitics of the time, you know, uh, which of course, yeah. uh, so the geopol, now <clears throat> we are now living, I think your, your students are writing, we are now living a time that this is, the post Cold War is over, the post 9-11 world is over. We are back to the great power competition. We are living in an era where the world global politics have returned back to the geo great power competition and states are part of pieces of that. My own view about Pakistan is that uh, Pakistan aspiration has never been a great power and probably you know should not be. But Pakistan actually began with an ambition of, and it was almost treated like one in the 1960s. I call it back to the future, as a, to rise as a middle power. It's not great power, there are middle powers. And middle power are a very essential component of uh, international security and balance. So that brings your question about the trilateral part is that Pakistan external policy as a nuclear power has to be a middle power, a country that is not based on, uh, on alliance politics so that it is only surviving to serve the interest of other powers. For 70 years, in my view, Pakistani foreign policy has been to serve the interest of other powers at the cost of your own interest. And that was because of your geostrategic location and the nature of internal politics that has happened, the civil military relations, how the, how the regimes in the country has survived over a period of time, and really a perpetuity of, like an obsessive perpetuity of rivalry between India and Pakistan. That has really taken down the drift in South Asia. You know. And I have to say this rather sadly that given the dynamics that is happening, particularly in India, because India is the 80% South Asia is India, India leads. So South Asian direction is going to be where India takes it. So India has become so nationalist. And we talk about the USA here as well, and a lot of critique of uh, Trump and others talk about, if Dr. Brzezinski was alive, he would have said, United States is not to dominate the world, it is to lead the world. India does not lead, India is so obsessed with domination. And that it tries to dominate so much that even the weakest country starts saying, I have had enough of your how long can I bandwagon with you? There's a slippery slope of bandwagoning in the end you capitulate. South Asian countries are not going to become sick. In. Even Nepal is standing up now. You know that, what's going on in that world. Sri Lanka stood up at some point, enough is enough. And I can say no matter what regime, even Bangladesh will eventually say enough is enough. So the or only Bhutan, country that- Bhutan for that matter, you know. Yeah, yeah, so you can see that the, what I see 20 years, 10, 20 years from now, is unless and unless India changes back to what was essentially called the Gujral way of dealing with the neighbors. It's, it's a rhetorical thing to say neighbor first. You actually you squeeze the neighbor down so much. And if you're a nuclear armed country, there's no question that you're going to be armed twisted into things. You know? So, so you know, you cannot become, Pakistan cannot become a West Bangladesh. So, so do it. So, and this will not happen. That would be an effect that happened even in the absence of say, 
miraculously. So in the next 10, 20 years, no matter what, I, I see that, uh, and, and I'm saying this much more, <laughs> Mr. Paul, people <laughs> say a lot that I say, I see that the, uh, the line of control will eventually become the border between India and Pakistan. There's no other solution left. And I think there will be some kind of a respite for the people of Kashmir that happens. Because the way the autonomous area of uh, autonomous Ladakh has become, has now become a problem between India and China now. You know, see that. This is what has happened at the border. Uh, what's going on between India and China at the moment. And you can hear in what of Indian commentators, they say the real reason what this pushes that you know the more India tries to push forward this is back to the 1962 the reason 62 what happened was India would just start inching and inching and inch until the Chinese said enough is enough and they start pushing it back so the Indian narrative is that the Chinese are pushing it back the, the, the Chinese narrative is that, like hey you're changing your behavior we don't know this is we come back to the history of 62 this is exactly what was happening there so eventually you know they had to whack it in, the, in 1962. My own view is that, you know, India tests these border areas because a conflict with China, when India does a conflict with China, actually suits India. My grandfather used to say that India likes, loves to have a war with, with China in 1962 because that's the only way a non-aligned India can stay non-aligned and still bring everyone to, to the rescue of India because at the time, Soviet Union was pissed off with the Chinese. So the Soviets will throw in weapons to India and the Americans, they said, holy moly, we are having Cuban war here. And this is China-India war going on. So they started pumping all the weaponry to India. And India said, thank you. This is what non-alignment actually means. You know? So India would love to do that. A conflict and the border suits India geopolitically because it actually attracts the Western world towards the Indian narrative to say, I told you so that Chinese are nasty. And it helps India. So we will see where, where it actually goes over the border thing, but you know, tactical on the border is different than the geopolitics of the whole situation. So in the next 10, 15 years, I can see that you know this um, the Pakistan becoming a middle power will be perceived to be a middle power closely allied or partnered with China. And uh, that would uh, mean that Pakistan would likely be steering away from the Western country. I don't think that's a good foreign policy for Pakistan. The best position for a middle power country is that it can have distant and equal relationship with all. And that is what Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, I, I think, or you Khan at the time, during, when Bhutto was foreign minister, that was called triangular tightrope walking. If you talk to all diplomats, they're going to tell you what this triangular tightrope walking was. And that was how, how, how a middle power can actually balance between Moscow, Washington, and Beijing. And that's that's what is going to be for a nuclear arm Pakistan to really turn the foreign policy in that direction, you know, and you have the capability to do that. But sadly, I have to say that unless and until the internal house is put into order, external strength does not come with nuclear power or any other power. Uh, the cumulative national power is important and nuclear weapons is just one component of that. But if your cumulative national power is weak, the nuclear weapons, instead of becoming uh, an accomplimentary to enhance your national prestige and position, becomes a liability in India. And, and, and this is just plain fact of international logical way of thinking, you know, uh, for international relations, basically. So as of this time of point, I think there was one of the students of your who asked me the question, how does the foreign policy been affected, you know? And so, rather than be answering, it's a very simple thing for any researchers to answer, uh, that in the 20 years, so 20, 22 years of Pakistan, uh, has Pakistan's, of course, an, you have improved your deterrence and that's a separate debate altogether. There's no question about the invincibility or about those questions. But I think it has reduced influence in overall. And it has no relation with the nuclear weapons per se. The reduction of influence is because of many other factors that has happened. The internal collapse of, uh, you know, the Jihadi network, the people going away, people are not investing in the country. So there are many factors that was existing in the 60s, 70s, and the 80s are no longer there. So you have, a, have to have a very different challenging tool. And I'm not saying this cynically, I'm just saying as a matter of factually, what has happened. So 
the question that you asked was about that how does this, the, the whole learning curve happen you know uh, i think the question was is more about how i think as robert jervis says nuclear revolution the meaning of nuclear revolution how do state powers behave when they become nuclear powers it takes a time it takes a while it doesn't happen automatically uh, the, the tendency of states are to continue a behavior as normal it's called that role drag they continue to drag their role as they were before uh, cold war ended you continue to do that 9/11 happened you continue to do that things are happening but the behavior doesn't change because there's an organization who continue to behave in certain ways it takes a long time for the leadership to get to know the analysis to be done how to shift those changes it's a long curve it starts a sudden u turn take a long time to do that and so is the meaning of the meaning of nuclear revolution dawns in a very slower pace you know so i could argue all these things about 5 years 10 years so the first decade of nuclear learning in south asia now we already crossed we getting into the third decade now we cannot say that the nuclear learning curve we are still learning in the larger scheme of thing yes you are still learning but i think a large number of lessons are already learned now you should be knowing as to what nuclear powers you know uh, nuclear powers don't simply just say when things come we are a nuclear power by your statement or your rhetorical way of talking you don't become a nuclear power nuclear power conducts a diplomacy in a very very different very aggressive way aggressive diplomacy peace initiative it comes out with all those ideas strategic restraint regime was a very sort of very aggressive diplomatic idea for peace and security you break that because what strategic restraint regime was coined into 2000 1998 1999 during my time when i was in office is very different now so we got to bring out with some other idea something different that meets the the challenges of, of contemporary times you know uh, to me those 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 ideas of balancing is required so yeah i mean so on, on balance you've done good and on balance uh, good you could have done better in many ways uh but that's my that's my answer about uh, the foreign policy impact you know wow um it's been fascinating insights uh feroz uh huge uh, learning for me every time we have a conversation i would like to thank you uh for all those conversations we had when i was doing my phd and that helped shape a lot of my my own thoughts about the subject and uh, so i want to be on record thank you for that and your thank you for guidance uh, to this day uh, you are a huge uh, you know asset for us uh, as an academic uh, your contribution to the country i uh, as an academic uh, understand uh, the the problems that you can you must have faced while writing the book and we did talk about that I'm glad that you brought about the elements of national power um, and uh, how you feel that this is just a very small part of it, and what Pakistan needs to do in order to become a middle power, which has has so much potential to be. Um, I'm sure my viewers uh, and my students uh, would benefit from this conversation. There's a lot that has been said, a lot of ground that has been covered. uh there's so many questions that still remain we could go on for hours and i know that you have immense capacity uh to you know speak on uh all these subjects uh endlessly uh but uh, we come to an end um for this uh, for this conversation right now i would like to thank you uh for your time and availability today uh and for this extremely exciting conversation and uh, until next time we meet uh i hope that it's a post covid world where everybody is back to normal uh i wish you uh, i'm glad that you said that um, you know monterey has not had any cases of covid yet and i just hope that good that it remains so uh so maybe meet in exciting times uh, and maybe have a peaceful south asia Uh, for you to welcome back to whenever it is the next time for you to visit us uh, with this i would like to close this conversation and uh, we will look forward to you know remaining engaged on our academic and non academic basis
So thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here. Sabia, thank you so much. I, I want to just thank you and your organization and everyone. Thank you so much for, for giving me this opportunity. And just one last word I would say, certainly you talked about the future. I don't think I'm the future. You have the future right under your wings right now. Um, I've been with the military service. I've been almost two decades in the academic world. And obviously, like everybody else, it's a conveyor belt. I'll, I'm not future. I'll fade away. But I hope, you know, the future is lying. Those who are getting on the conveyor belt right under your wings. They are the future. And I hope they will, whatever we leave behind, they will pick up the metal and take it there. I wish you all good luck. Thank you Absolutely, so much. Absolutely, they will. Thank you so much for all your best wishes. Uh, so until next time, take good care. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you.